Thank you very, very much for coming. Uh, my name is Gareth Cliff. I'm, I'm here under the auspices of a, uh, a, a joint effort with the Nelson Mandela Foundation today and with uh, the, the people I, I represent, I'm a patron for, Headway, which we'll get to in a moment or two. But to begin proceedings, I'd like to ask the CEO of uh, this facility, this institution, this uh, terrific place that does so much good work, I'd like to ask Dr. Otiana to come up and uh, address us right at the start. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, now that sounds more lively. No, I'm happy to see you all come today. Um, this is a beautiful place. I'm sure you'll all agree with me at the end of it, and I hope you'll have a, a chance to go around and enjoy the facilities. Okay, thank you, Program Director. Professor Johnson, Dr. Motlana, I think the other speakers, uh, Sherry Briner, Nico Hodson, the CEOs of hospitals, senior managers, our partners in mental health care, representatives from the community, the hostel board, Tara management, the distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. Allow me to extend a warm welcome to all of you as I've already done, that you found time to come and join us for this crucial conversation. We really appreciate that. To the Nelson Mandela Foundation and Hands Across Africa, thank you for choosing us for this critical dialogue. It makes us feel really special today, and it gives us hope as mental health care users and givers. There is much hope as today we are going to publicly discuss some of the serious issues that affect mental health care. We are going to discuss them openly, raising awareness and promoting mental health in all ways. Now, mental health and psychiatric conditions are poorly understood and they are feared by most people in society, both the common man and the professionals. And it's, it's sad to say that even the professionals actually fear mental health. Indeed, we look after very vulnerable people in the community, people without a voice, people who are highly stigmatized. And talking about them brings this out in the open. There is an urgent need for the society to change and embrace mental disorders so that we can realize positive change towards caring for this vulnerable community. And there's no better way to do this than to discuss mental health issues as we are going to do today. Now, mental health illnesses are now on the rise. Very, very soon, they will surpass HIV AIDS. And the response from the civil society and governments is critical. We hope that we will see the government and the civil society working together in an unprecedented scale to promote mental health awareness and treatment as it did for HIV AIDS, because this is the next pandemic after HIV AIDS. Sadly, the mental health lags behind. There is serious mismatch between the resources available and the demand. Stigma and misperceptions around mental health is huge. Now, to bridge this huge gap calls for a concerted effort by all of us, and indeed a holistic approach whereby the importance of personal and social responsibility is emphasized. Now, social responsibility is important in linking the communities to the health systems. That is something that is seriously lacking in the communities. Tara Hospital, that's where we are today, is known for providing quality and unique services in the province. It's committed to actively raising the quality of care and the quality of life for every mental health care user, irrespective of race, religion, and circumstances, to achieve a meaningful life. We care for adults and children with serious mental illnesses. Our task is to make this possible. Our mission is to provide a practical step-by-step -step assistance for mental health care users to realize this. 
And to this end, we have very dedicated um, staff members who are passionate about their work and who work under very difficult conditions. It is a demanding job, and to all of them, I salute them, the professional health caregivers and the caregivers. Thank you for sharing this event with us, making Tara part of the great legacy of Madiba, where dialogue is key. Once again, I request Tara staff to join me in offering a warm-hearted welcome to all of you. Welcome to this beautiful place of holistic healing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor. And uh, I already feel very at home. I don't know what that, uh, that, whether that says that this is a welcoming place or whether it says that maybe I belong here. <laughs> Either way, that's okay. I'd like to call on um, the CEO of the Nelson Mandela Foundation, Mr. Selo Hatang. Um, but I think, uh, uh, Gareth, I, I need to make a declaration here because... Um, uh, you know, working for an NGO that I work for, you, you have to declare benefits that you get as a result of being uh, the, the chief executive. Is that uh, I met the, the CEO of Tara, the, 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 the chairman of Tara, the board, and uh, she, she offered uh, me a room uh, here. I don't know what it means, uh, whether she saw me as a candidate immediately <laughs> because we had just met uh, and she offered me a room. But I offered to share it with you. Um, so, apparently the view is very good. Um, but I think today for us is, uh, is, is about uh, 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 two things. It's, it's, uh, it's, of, co uh, it's of course about uh, us marking Mandela Day, um, where we're saying for, for us it's, it's not about July, where you, you care because it's Madiba's birthday, but that we say you must care every day. That's why the mantra for Mandela Day is take action, inspire change, make every day a Mandela day. And we hope that through events like this, we'd be able to at least inspire change in terms of how we treat mental illnesses. That there's more awareness that all of us are candidates. Um, when I met uh, an incredible uh, uh, person who, who has had two accidents, uh, major accidents and suffered uh, mental injury. That can happen to any one of us. And it's something that we should always remind ourselves of. That's why uh, we, we've just walked through um, to the children's wards. And, and, uh, and I was saying to Gareth, you know, for the first time, I realized that I'm very lucky that I have three children who are very healthy, uh, that I don't have to even think about um, uh, them being, being looked after the way the, 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 these children are looked after. But I told him about a story while I was still at the Human Rights Commission that we were called, uh, uh, in, I think it was in Limpopo, where um, uh, parents of a mentally uh, uh, challenged child uh, chained the child to a tree. So when they go to work in the morning, because the child would go then and, and destroy people's properties, and then they would chain the child. And I think uh, um, that is a, one example of how things can go seriously wrong. Uh, but it's, uh, it's thanks to Tara and institutions like this that we're grateful. Um, and today is the second thing that I'd like to say is that we pay homage. We here as the Nelson Mandela Foundation to pay our respect to health workers uh, who do incredible work. I mean, the two, the two uh, uh, nurses who, who took us through the children's ward, uh, just describing what the children have to go through every day tells you that we're very lucky. When you have a healthy child, you should always think to yourself that I'm lucky. But that luck shouldn't just end there. You should then give something in return. And this is us coming back to give. And I think uh, I'd like to, to say to Dr. Otieno that we, we're grateful for people like you and uh, we'd like to pay homage and respect to you and your team because it's through you that we see that we are human through the touch of other human beings like you. Um, you make us feel normal that we are uh, human because of your touch. And I want to, 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 to assure you that, uh, and Gareth, uh, to thank you for your commitment for Mandela Day, uh, because this for us is, uh, is again leaving the legacy, where we, we say that to leave the legacy, you don't have to be like Nelson Mandela. 
but you can take a leaf from uh, his life and do a little bit that you can. And you being here today gives us hope that we will be able to achieve that goal. I want to end off with a quote uh, by Madiba uh, where he is talking about issues of mental health when he says, human beings regard their mental capacity as the most defining feature of themselves as a species. To respond in a caring manner, like Dr. Otieno and uh, her team, um, to, respond to, a, in, to respond in a caring manner to the impairment of those capacities in others is to really know ourselves as human beings and to live, to live out our humaneness. So today, we're hoping that we'd be able to do that, that we show that touch uh, to the others, that this dialogue doesn't end here, that each and every one of us, and I, I, I love doing that, by the way, um, so, uh, the, the, you know, uh, holding, uh, the, that, that's the future, holding the future um, is always special. So, uh, for us to be able to, to, to be here, we hope that we won't end here, that each and every one of us will do something as soon as we leave these doors, to know that we candidates here, and before you become a candidate, you can play your part. Thank you very much. What we really want to do is facilitate a discussion and a conversation here, but I would like to introduce us all to uh, one of our guests. I only met her today, but her reputation precedes her. I heard about her from uh, Prof. Jonathan Janssen, who's on his way here now, a man who is a lighthouse, a beacon, not just for education, but for, I think, a, a shared humanity, absolutely, in South Africa, and an idea of what is right, and sometimes saying things that are not popular, because he's a, a man of extraordinary principle. He'll be here in a moment or two, but he did mention at the last Hands Across South Africa, which is an initiative which um, I began with Rina a while ago on Mandela Day, because we felt that we needed to do something collectively, just as we are today. It was a simple, symbolic gesture of taking the hand of the person next to you. Today, we repeat that symbolic gesture, and Hands Across South Africa is very simple. If you decide to be a member now, you're a member. It's as easy as that. And all you have to do is bring us good news, tell us about the good work that you do, and we'll share it with everybody. So, Prof. Janssen was at our, one of our conversations earlier in the year, and he was talking about someone who he finds very inspiring. Her name is Sherry uh, Brainard. She is the only person with Down syndrome who's a qualified teacher in the world. She received a national diploma from the Moteo FET College in Bloemfontein, South Africa. The papers were set and marked nationally and she was evaluated just the same way as all the non-Down syndrome students. So she is a shining example, not in this case of mental health, but of someone who has overcome enormous obstacles and has made absolutely no excuses for herself. She's taken on responsibilities that most people who have all the advantages of not having a genetic condition or a mental health condition would make. The excuses that we would start making before the fact, none of those apply in Sherry's case. I'm delighted to introduce you to Sherry Brainard. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for inviting me here today. You make me feel very special. Thank you for the opportunity you are giving me to try to change perceptions about people with intellectual disabilities. It gives meaning to my life. As you can see, I am a person with Down syndrome, of which I am very proud. Some people with Down syndrome are just partially affected. I am not like that. Every cell in my body has one extra chromosome. My mother has tried to explain to me what that means, but you will have to ask her if you don't understand how it happens. All I know is this is a genetic disorder, and that means it is not hereditary in most cases. The condition is called 
Trisomy 21. I know I have an extra chromosome. But dear ladies and gentlemen, most of us have problem situations from time to time. I am so lucky that my problem has a name. <laughs> when I was born, many people told my mother, don't worry, they don't live long. Ladies and gentlemen, luckily this is a disillusion of the past. As you know, our life expectation can be up to about 60 to 70 today. My mother always says that she wants to look after me until we die together one day. Which means that she might have to become around 90 years old. I wonder who is going to look after whom? at that stage. But, ladies and gentlemen, life and death is not in our hands, but what we do with our lives. I was born about 31 years ago, and my grandmother's friends wanted to pray for me to become normal. But my mother asked them rather to pray that I would receive the support to reach my full potential as a person with Down syndrome. My parents were happy with me as I was. This was also the way they raised me. They accepted me unconditionally. My mother taught me to embrace diversity in people. She always says, life Life would be so boring if we were all the same. The philosophy that helped Nelson Mandela to stay after 27 years in jail was the following phrase. You are the master of your destiny. And you are also the captain of your soul. Ladies and gentlemen, we must all take responsibility for who we are and not hide. <clears throat> and not hide behind all the reasons we can think of to feel sorry for ourselves or to explain why we are not what we want to be. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me to strive to become the person we want to be. Forget about failures of the past and start focusing on the future. Sometimes our life journey is difficult, but if the journey is without obstacles, you will not learn much. If you can face each obstacle with determination and gut. You make a difference in life. <clears throat> Remember, it is up to each of us to make the world a better place. You cannot always change the circumstances. But you can change the way you look at them. I was born with intellectual and certain physical disabilities. But my parents did not focus on that. They really tried to develop the things I could do. My mother expected of me to do my best in everything I do. She also expected of me to try to fit in socially. The fact that she never showed me that she was sorry for me helped me to grow. I believe one must never focus on what you don't have, but be proud of who you are. I strongly believe 
One must work hard to make the best of who you are. I was in Marty Duplessis School, a school for learners with cerebral palsy and learning difficulties, for 15 years. I felt at home there. We followed the national curriculum and I was the only learner with Down syndrome who attended this school. I had to work hard to stay there. But there were times when my mother was so afraid that they would ask me to leave. Like the times he found out that I had a habit of hiding from the teachers and therapists. Some boys at school made fun of me because I looked different from them. That was one difficult thing of a school with only normal children. You may have problems fitting in. So I started to ask the boys whether they wanted my extra chromosome And then they left me alone. <laughs> One should try not to let people hurt you so easily. Forgive them and don't focus on the negative things they say. Later, the children chose me as class captain and it made me feel as if I belong there. I will always be thankful for that. I received a National Grade 10 certificate before leaving Marty Duplessis High School. That last year at school, I received a prize for the highest marks in biology. And I received the highest honor of the school for drama accomplishments on national level between normal learners. This happened, although my parents had to struggle to get me to be accepted at the school because of their policy at that stage. During my time in school, I knew I had to fit in or leave. My mother told me to look what normal children do and try to do the same. I don't think she knows how naughty the normal kids were. <laughs> After leaving school, I went to the Mateo College, a technical, a technical national college. I was also the first and only person with Down syndrome to be accepted there. We wrote three our papers, which was set and marked nationally. With the grace of our dear Lord and a lot of hard work and an ulcer, because I stressed so much, I passed the N3 course, which equals matric. And after that, I passed the N4, N5 and N6 courses. The in six course is the highest qualification at the college. I also passed my practical education and was awarded the education diploma on Educare in May 2009. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you, it was not always easy to pass my subject. I failed some of my subject again and again and sometimes again but I never gave up I only tried harder because I wanted to fulfill my dreams I never felt sorry for myself it is a waste of energy.
And I felt a lot of determination to pass because I wanted to show myself that I can if I work hard. This was my dream. My rope and motorboard had to be adjusted to a smaller size. And when I walked over the podium to receive my diploma, I was so surprised when all the people in the city hall stood up for me. I was also awarded a special prize for being the first and only person with Down syndrome in South Africa to receive a national diploma. This was the most amazing moment of my life. I looked at all the people and saw my mother crying. All the hard work was worthwhile. And you know what, ladies and gentlemen, I'm so very happy to work at Lady Fouchier, a special school for learners with learning problems as assistant in the pre-primary classes now. That was my field of study. I enjoy every day and help the teacher to give lessons and to stimulate the learners. When the teacher has other responsibilities, I take her place and I enjoy that so much. I know it's not right, but sometimes I'm so happy when teacher only becomes a little ill. <laughs> so that I can teach the children. I love the children and feel sorry for them because I know that the person with disabilities has all kinds of problems. I hope you don't think I am bragging, but I cannot believe all the wonderful things I am blessed with. Down syndrome international asked me to do the keynote speech at the conference in New York on Down syndrome international day on the 21st of March this year. The conference was held in the United Nations building and the speech was translated and broadcasted in four languages all over the world on YouTube. <laughs> there were more than 40,000 deeds that day and the people are still logging in. In this speech, I thank the Lord for blessing me the way he does. And I got the only standing ovation of the day. I think the Lord got the standing ovation. And I praise him for that. Down Syndrome International gave me an award last year for the work I am doing to change perceptions about people with Down syndrome. They also asked me to be on the Down Syndrome International Board, to be an ambassador for all people with Down syndrome in the world. I have also visited the International Down syndrome offices in London twice. One of the highlights of my life was when I was chosen as Women of the Year for the category Youth Movers last year. There were, <laughs> there were many wonderful women who have made our country proud. I was among these people. Me, a girl with Down syndrome, a condition which make people abort their babies and lock them in institutions or at the back of their homes so that other people cannot see them. I have met two little boys who were left in hospitals by their parents when I talked in Joburg once. Both children's parents felt that their little boys 
did not fit into the educational profiles. I am standing here today to try to change these perceptions about us. Ladies and gentlemen, we deserve to live. And we can have a full life. And we can even make a difference in people's lives. I want to cry when I think of all the little unborn babies like me who do not get the basic chance in life to live. No wonder I have so much problems finding a nice boyfriend in Bloemfontein. <laughs> the fact that I was presented the, with a presidential award, which is the highest award in South Africa, who have made a contribution in the lives of mentally handicapped people, means so much to me. This award was presented at the gala function of the Hamlet Foundation in Joburg. And it made me realize that any person can make a difference. Dear ladies and gentlemen, why the Lord blesses me so much, I do not know. Last year, I passed an edition to play in a TV production, Binnenland. And I had a genuine talking role as Mari. And they gave me my own dressing room. Makeup artist and hair stylist. My mother stressed so much, like always, but she never went on the set. Oh, it was the best week of my whole life. I pray for guidance every day. And after my father died, I also prayed for the strength to go on with my life. I decided not to feel sorry for myself. With the help of the Lord, one can do anything if one really tries very hard. When my family is with me, I can only hold out my hand and someone will always help me. May our dear Father provide you with the people and structures you need when you hold out your hand to him. Or even better, may there be times that it will be your hand that will help people over the hurdles of life. Ladies and gentlemen, we must all be proud of who we are. Life has happiness and sadness, but it depends on us, on what we do with our lives. Success is measured against oneself. Never compare you to others. Make the most of your opportunities and know that the Lord made us all special. Be thankful for normal intelligence and know that the Lord will always look after you if you work hard and trust in him. A world-famous pianist once said that there is no such thing as a false note. Some notes may sound false to us, but in reality it just sounds different. Ladies and gentlemen, please give people with disabilities the opportunities to be proud of their differences. My dream is for the world to become a place where the general population respects, encourages, and enables its disabled citizens to make a contribution in life develop to their full potential and feel that they have a purpose in life. Today, I can truly thank the Lord for making me exactly as I am. 
a person with Down syndrome. And Kozi Sikilele i Africa. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Another standing ovation. Thank you so much. First of all, uh, from Headway, which is the organization for which I'm a patron, and I do very little, I don't do nearly enough, but it's uh, a small part of my time and a great part of my joy that I get to work with people who have brain injuries whom Headway takes care of. Um, Headway is a, an organization, an, a non-profit organization, that looks after people who've had various kinds of brain injuries, accidents, um, they've, they've, they've undergone some kind of trauma to the head, usually, and they have anything from severe to mild brain injury, which results, obviously, in some cognitive and some other physical problems. But today, I'm happy to introduce you to Nicolene, who is one of Headway's stars, because she has um, managed, she told me just now, in, in the last little while, she started working again, which is no small feat. Um, Nicolene underwent two big accidents, and she is a survivor. She's also, please sit down, Nicolene. Um, we'll give you a nice round of applause that you can stand up for in a second. Nicolene has uh, also just recently started working again. She's now a laughter therapist, something I'm sure we can all do with more of. And uh, she told me that she's uh, had a boyfriend for four months, which is <laughs> very good news too. Um, and I'm delighted that every year I get to see some of the incredible people at Headway making all kinds of progress thanks to the occupational therapists, to the people who take time out of their day, and uh, the permanent workforce of Headway who put in huge amounts. I think Dr. Motlana is probably the person who's most capable of talking about just about everything that we have here. Um, actually, Dr. Motlana started at Tara Hospital and uh, pursued a career in business has been a consultant of the Eating Disorder Unit, Head of Clinical Services here at Tara Hospital, uh, also the, uh, bo on the Board of Directors of Clinics Holdings, involved in fundraising for the development of the Neuropsychiatric Service here at Tara, a board member of the Johannesburg Child and Parent Counseling Center, on the Executive Committee of the South African Society of Psychiatrists, Organizing Committee of two international congresses, the Psychiatry, Psychology, and Philosophy Conference in 2007. Also, psychiatry in the private practice at Life Fourways Hospital, in the public sector, work in forensic psychiatry, and uh, a fellow of the College of Psychiatrists. Please, ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Dr. Ellen Mutlana. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mutlana. Um, what we'd like to do is just get people talking today. It's part of what Hands Across South Africa and the Nelson Mandela Foundation believe in. Dialogue. We want to remove stigma. I think that's more important than anything else. One thing that really bothers me about any kind of intellectual or mental disability, and I'm sure that our panelists will agree, is that people treat it differently to a physical illness. And people treat it different, differently to a physical disability. Somehow, there's some some bridge that people don't manage to cross when it comes to something that has to do with the mind, which they have no problem dealing with when it comes to the body. And I think that that stigma needs to be corrected first and foremost. And I think it's an appropriate place to ask Dr. Mutlana to maybe make some opening remarks on what Tara does in that respect, because we are here and it is important that we acknowledge the uh, heavy lifting that goes on in places like Tara, where young people and older people are taken care of, are seen to, are given what they need in terms of either medicine, counseling, um, education. There's a school here. And uh, I think, Dr. Matlana, you have experience in all of these areas. You could perhaps tell us what's going on. So what's going on is, um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, is that possibly our neighbors don't want us here. I think that's the most important point. 
we're in a situation of not in your backyard. Historically, psychiatric institutions have been on the outskirts, outside of society, where those that are sufferers of mental illnesses are hidden, not seen. And so we find ourselves in the fortunate position that this was a farm and now it's in the middle of prime property in Sandton. But our neighbors would have us go. And the reason being fear, stigma, and why we're here. And it's especially difficult because we need to break down what stigma is about. So first of all, I'd like to talk about public stigma. That's the stigma that causes us at TAR to suffer from tremendous barriers where we feel that working in the mental health care field is not all that important. When someone has to look at a budget, our health care budget is limited. they are limited resources. We have an epidemic, HIV AIDS, and we're not a life or death situation, or so they think. And so if they're going to spread resources, we are the last to benefit from that. So Tara is not unique. I'd like you to appreciate our grounds, but also to look around you and take in the dilapidated buildings, the infrastructure that's creaking and old. And it's not because the CEO and the executive team haven't noticed. It's not because we haven't made many efforts to keep the place up. It's because we're competing with other conditions, medical conditions, that simply get more attention. So a little bit about Tara. Um, Tara is famous because of its long history of working in multidisciplinary teams. And I think that's what characterizes the kind of work we do. You read modern literature and they're all talking about how service providers need to work in teams. Well, we've been doing that all along. And perhaps the model might be difficult now to replicate in um, private healthcare, but certainly we are doing it here. We have very specialized units, one of which is probably the one of its kind in public service, the eating disorder unit. But we also have a child unit, which is also one of two in Gauteng, um, sorry, one of three, and then the adolescent unit, which is one of two in Gauteng. Um, our work requires very, very specialized um, individuals who spent a lot of time um, acquiring those skills. They require um, patient to staff ratio that's extremely high. So it makes our services quite expensive. Um, so when people look at our output, especially those that make decisions about budgets, they look at our numbers and they can't justify the expense without really understanding the time that is required. Five nursing staff to a child, so we have to limit the numbers. Um, we are fortunate to have um, a Tara school which looks after our children and adolescents whilst they're, they're admitted at this hospital. Our other units, the biological units, um, look after those with serious mental illnesses, including um, conditions such as schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, major depressive disorder, and so on and so forth. So I spoke about a little about um, public stigma and how that hasn't shifted. Um, I've been, well, was previously the clinical head at TAR, but one of the other hats I wear is a director of an organization called Psychiatry Empowered, which I started with to my colleagues whilst I was in private practice. And we started out with great gusto because we thought that if we taught people about mental illness, they'd change their ideas. But unfortunately, the literature does not support that. Reviews of the last 10 years show that whilst people now know a little more about mental illness, we know that it's a brain disorder, brain disease, people's ideas, surprisingly, stigmatizing attitudes have not shifted. In fact, medicalizing mental illness has entrenched views that it's more depressing, that it's genetic, so you don't want to be part of it. So I just want to talk, touch a little bit about courtesy stigma. When I, I try not to tell people I'm a psychiatrist because I spend the whole evening talking about what I do otherwise. And, but the initial reaction is that people look at me with shock, laugh, feel uncomfortable, shift in their chairs, and do what some of you did earlier, laugh, when you're told that you could likely be admitted at TAR. So I ask you, so I've got the courtesy stigma, which is by association, because I'm a psychiatrist, therefore I must be somewhat different, strange, maybe it's contagious, maybe I'm a little bit mad, um, perhaps they should watch me carefully over dinner because I might turn out to be not what they expected. 
<laughs> in fact, I've heard of a school board, and I don't know how I got it onto my previous school board, maybe it was because I was a student there, it was my alma mater, where they refused to have a board member who was a psychiatrist. So I, I assure you it's the same for radio personalities. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of stigma there too. So I want to talk about courtesy stigma because it's not only, it talks, speaks to how we have to deal with our medical fraternity. So when we say difficult circumstances, Dr. Tiana alluded to that, it's budgetary, it's infrastructure, it's the courtesy stigma from our colleagues, the people we went to medical school with that say, but, but how did you, but why, psychiatry? Nobody's ever said that for cardiology, you know, and I think the heart muscle is quite uninteresting compared to the brain, excuse me. <laughs> but the, so the, these are some of the challenges and mental health professionals, unfortunately, are some of the very people that are, have those stigmatizing attitudes. So, so the battle is multi-pronged. Um, and then there's the institutional stigma um, where having been at Tara, for life, the fact that you've been there once is a mark for life because we see mental illness as something chronic, ongoing, with a poor prognosis and you're never ever going to find a husband, a boyfriend or marry into any family. Um, and so people don't want to talk about it and what that does to our patients means that they have self-stigma, so they stigmatize themselves. In other words, they feel that they're outsiders. They don't want to come for help. They're afraid to come for help unless the wheels have come off, so to speak. They need to be hospitalized involuntarily. And so they're not coming for help early enough. And we know with most psychiatric disorders, the earlier you step in and treat adequately, the better the outcome. Mm -hmm. So we're losing those people because what happens if you mention Tara? People laugh, they snigger, they're uncomfortable. So. I know it's sounding very depressing, but I think that we've moved, even in South Africa, when they did multinational studies looking at mental health literacy, so that's how much people understand about mental health, that has somewhat improved. Stigma, however, hasn't. And in fact, people don't want people with schizophrenia as their neighbors. So I think our neighbors are really not happy with us. <laughs> well, they and better they get used to it. It's not going to go, you're not going anywhere and, and they might. We hope that they're not going anywhere, but th this is what we're dealing with. And so I ask everybody to, to ask themselves when they laugh, what does that mean? What is the culture of stigmatizing attitudes? What is it in our behavior and our thinking that actually perpetuates those ideas and thoughts? Because the change starts with us. It starts in the conversations we have. It starts with people saying, oh, but you, you're the psychiatrist, you deal with the crazies. <laughs> and that if you have problems, you'd rather go to a psychologist because it's less medicalizing. And, or maybe and even a psychologist is too medical. See your friend, sort yeah. it out, get a grip, because you don't want to be stuck with that label. So these are just a few of my thoughts that I wanted to share with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. McClana. Um, I. I have one or two questions just now, but I'm sure there will be questions from the audience. Uh, at this point, and just before Nicolene, uh, Prof. Jonathan Janssen is here. He managed to find his way here. Now, he is a towering intellect, and what I love about this man is even though he's got one of the finest brains, certainly in the room and possibly in the whole country, he really does care about everyone's learning. He cares about those people who have intellectual disabilities right at the one end of the scale to those at the other end of the scale with many doctorates behind their names and he discriminates not an iota between them. Uh, for that reason, among many others, he's a friend of mine and someone that I'm delighted to have here today. It's a rare opportunity in his schedule that we managed to find time for, uh, for an engagement with him but I'm absolutely convinced that every occasion that we've had him at, he's added tremendous value to. So, is he here, Reans? Oh, then why did you show me that he was here already? Ah, okay, well then you shouldn't have done a damn thing, Reans. <laughs> Rena is my manager, by the way, and my manager, in preparation for ending up working with me, also worked at Tara for a time. Rena dealt with um, adolescents, uh, particularly talented adolescents who had, uh, had problems. So you can imagine that equipped her very well for dealing with me eventually. I'm, I think I, I'm probably still an adolescent in many ways, even though I don't look it yet anymore. And I'm sorry for that. Let me quickly introduce you to Nicolene and let her tell you her story. I mentioned a, a very brief sketch of what she's had to go through, 
But perhaps it's better to hear in her own words the, uh, the journey that she's traveled. Lekeleen. Uh, I'll stand, it's better. Hello. Um, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Nicoline. Um, in January, it'll be five years um, since I had my, my first accident. I was in a car accident. I um, think I rolled it. And I woke up 43 days later out of a coma. I fractured my neck in two places. And uh, that's how I sustained my, my brain injury. And being in denial and the personality that I am, all I wanted to do was go back to work and get my normal life back. And against, well, let me just get to all my ducks in a row. Um, my, my loving parents, which are here and they've supported me throughout the whole process, found out about headway. And thank God for that, because without headway, I'd be lost. Um, so I attended Headway when I came out of hospital and everybody at Headway advised me not to return back to work. I'm not ready. I didn't want to accept the fact that I have a brain injury and I just wanted to get my normal life back. So I went back to work against everybody's advice. So needless to say, that was the wrong decision to make. It didn't work out for me and it resulted in my second accident, which was the turning point for me because I went back to Headway a second time and that helped me accept my brain injury and get me to where I am now in January next year. It'll be five years since my first accident and I've now accepted the fact that I've got a disability. It's difficult for me though, because if you look at me, it doesn't seem like there's anything wrong with me. Even though I've got a brain injury, I've got a, I've got a silent injury. Um, it doesn't affect your intelligence. So I've got this executive... Um, uh, there's another word. <laughs> um, it's, it, it, the problems I have is memory and um, social interactions and aggression and um, I'm on psychiatric medication and, uh, you know, it's, I, I can't handle pressure. That's why I can't work like normal people do, even though normal is just a cycle on a washing machine. That's it, <laughs> you know. Um, I, I, I work for myself now. It's my mom and, and my mom and myself. We've got our own company. It's called Ladies of Laughter. Um, we, we we laugh to therapists because I can't I can't work under under pressure. I, I will attack my boss with the 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 most painful object I, I find. So, you know, but. I, I want to make I want to make it work and 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 just like this very inspiring young woman over here I, w I want to I want to speak out for those who who can't and 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 just change the world and you know if I if I can and I'm sure I can so I'm, I'm glad that we we have opportunities like today where we can openly discuss problems and well not problems we can where we can openly discuss challenges and things that humanity has been scared scared of discussing because they don't understand it. That's the biggest thing. Things people don't understand, they fear. And, and that, that's just wrong. Because at the end of the day, we're all just people and people are strange. But you know what? I mean, I'm even stranger. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah, every, everybody's strange. But thank you for having me. And um, I, I look forward to the rest, the rest of the discussion. Thanks, Gareth. So, Prof. Jonathan Janssen, I mentioned earlier, manages to span the entire intellectual spectrum. And Nicolene, you said something very true just a moment ago, and it's true for everyone here. Um, this has nothing to do, mental health has nothing to do with intelligence. There are extremely intelligent people, and there are extremely unintelligent people who equally suffer from mental health conditions of all kinds. And I'm sure Dr. Motlana will later extrapolate for us how too often it's, it's a question of lumping all mental health issues together. Um, that's why 
you have a mental health hospital, which includes everybody from the depressed to the schizophrenic to the manic to the intellectually disabled. All of these are lumped into one group. But Prof, that's the condition of humanity, is it not? And on that note, someone who is not only the rector of the University of the Free State and a uh, shining light in South African education, but also a man who cares very deeply about a positive and healthy mental attitude to the mental health of others. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Sorry, I got horribly lost. And uh, uh, it's really, really good to be here and to see some people whom I know, such as Sheree. When she spoke at our graduation ceremony, I invited her to be the, 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 the main speaker. And, you know, as she delivered with such incredible passion and clarity uh, her message, I looked down on the four or 5,000 people that day and there was not a dry eye in the house. And I think the reason was not because she has Down syndrome. I think it's because she conveyed a message of hope, a message of just looking. Somebody asked me at UNISA now where I did a lecture. They asked me, what's your definition of leadership? I said, it's very simple. Leadership for me means looking at the same thing that everybody else sees, but seeing it very differently. That's it. You with me? Um, now, my son is a psychologist, so we've been having a bit of a bad time because he's just gotten his, you know, master's in psychology, so he's like a big shot. So he comes home the other day, and he looks at his mad family, and he says, here's material here for a whole 10 years, you know, just, <laughs> I, you guys can keep me busy, you know, it's horrible. It's horrible when your own child tells you, you know, the fruit of your loins, you know, here's material I can work with for 10 years, you know. Uh, it's absolutely horrible. I, I tell you, children are terrible, eh? Uh, uh, you met by uh, 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 Rina and, and um, Gareth. Uh, I was trying to get Rina's name this morning, and I called my secretary, and I said, man, that, that woman who's attached to Gareth, what's her name again? <laughs> so my secretary says, you mean Emma? I said, no, the broom lady. <laughs> Broomberg, Rina Broomberg, you know. But children, I mean, they met my daughter. I mean, she's, you know she was born uh, with a, a, a half deaf in one of her ears. And, um, and I love her very much because throughout her life, she's getting a degree now at the end of the year. At least she's finishing up. She, graduation is in March. And throughout her life, we didn't once tell our daughter about the ear that doesn't work. We told her about the other ear. And that's the difference. You know, and that's why I'm so happy to be here today. Um, now, let me tell you about the most famous experiment ever done in my field in education. I'm going to take you through this very slowly. With students, I normally take 40 minutes. Uh, and that's if they're awake. Um, so I'm going to take you. This is the most famous uh, piece of research ever done in education. Unfortunately, for reasons that will become clear in a minute, you can't do this kind of research anymore. Now, you must have heard this story before. They took two classes, and the one class were the really, really bright kids. You know the classes in which you're likely to find uh, Rina. And then they took the class that was not so bright. You know, the class in which you're likely to find Gareth. And, <laughs> and they brought in two, sorry, I, had, I need props. You know, um, so they brought in two teachers from the outside who didn't know the kids. And they told them the exact opposite. In other words, the really, really A, A plus students, they said this is the slow class. And the really, really struggling students, they said to them, this is the bright class. <laughs> the teachers didn't know. Teach them. So they taught them for a period of time. What do you think happened when the results came out? Anybody here? Excuse me, ma'am. The ones who they thought were bright performed le worse than the ones that they thought were not. Oh God, you sound like a free state graduate. That is correct. <laughs> the Vitz guys normally get it wrong. So, exactly. <laughs> exactly. The kids who were not supposed to do well flourished. And the kids that were supposed to like wing it, their results went down. So, here's the question. 
What is the moral of that story? Yes, ma'am. Oh, gosh, now you're putting me on the spot. <laughs> Preconceived ideas. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Self-fulfilling prophecies. Meaning? You've got to that unpack that for us. Oh. You know, some of us work in the cabinet. <laughs> Make it simple. The China cabinet. <laughs> the Zuma cabinet. <laughs> it means that if you call, give a dog a bad name and he'll live up to it. So if you treat a child as if they're stupid, they're going to start acting stupid. What does that say about teachers? They're not that smart, are they? <laughs> Here's the key, and of course I can't do this in less than five minutes. The expectations you have of other people matter more than the teacher. Matter more than the teacher. That if you keep telling people what they can't do, guess what? They live up to that expectation. But if you keep telling people, do you know what the big difference is? I've spent a big chunk of my life in, in the United States. Do you know what the big difference is between the United States and South Africa as far as child rearing is concerned? Every American kid, black or white, will tell you when you say, what do you want to become one day? What do they say? I want to become president of South Africa. You know? Tell a South African kid in a township, what do you want to become one day? Ice comrade, you know, we the historically disadvantaged era. It goes on a long, long story about how bad things are. It's horrible. It's horrible. We are constantly victims. You know, one of the reasons I'm late, I might as well confess, Adrina, I stopped here where I saw a guy with a big board. My wife, Estelle de Lange, is in Garden City for a op. I need donations. Did you see that guy? So I called Garden City. There's no bloody Estelle de Lange in Garden City. You know, we, because uh, I was going to help. I was going to make a donation of like, you know, five cents or something. And so this is a country that constantly talks itself down. We do it in the schools. We even do it in our churches, our mosques, our synagogues and temple. We keep telling us what kind of ruling party comes to power. Do you know what the first document was the ANC put out? If this didn't tell you we were going to be in trouble, you know, you know what the title of the document was? Ready to govern. Damn it, you've been in exile for so long, you're supposed to be ready. What were you doing? <laughs> ready to govern. Only a person who doubts himself says, comrades, ready to govern. <laughs> Do you know of another country that before the World Cup, soccer World Cup came here? Do you remember the debates on TV? Will we be ready? I knew we'd be ready because we're normally ready for big things. We're not ready for small things like making sure there's water. Don't, don't go to the toilet here. There's no water. <laughs> What's that? Oh, my God. So I have from the day my children were born. I told them what they could do, you know. To this day, they're 23 and 26, to this day, I go into my daughter's room. Like this morning when I left at 5 o'clock for the airport, and I say, Sarah, oh, Dad, please go away. Not you again. I said, Sarah, I want you to know you're going to be the first South African woman that flies an airbrush across the Atlantic. Dad, you keep saying that every day. She's tired of me already. Then I go to my son's room. Now he's now out of the house. And I say, son, you are going to be the next president of South Africa. Now I know that's not true for the same reason Trevor Manuel won't be president. But I... <laughs> Don't you just love our country? <laughs> but <laughs> it's... A... I can see some of you are a bit slow today, but um, <laughs> it's the weather, it's the weather. But I want my son to know, just like I want my daughter to know what they can do, not what they can't do. Everything in Cherie's life, from the moment she was born, people came to her mother and said, let's pray for her to be normal. In other words, like other people. 
big mistake. You are who you are. And if you told me that one day this beautiful young woman would have gotten a college degree, would have become a teacher, would have stood up. You know, when I looked at her this morning, I didn't know she was on the same plane while I was working, uh, giving comments to her mother on a book. Um, I didn't know she was on the plane. And as the bus, you know, if you go to Bloemfontein, you must always take a little bus to get to the um, baggage. Uh, she sort of winked at me and greeted and went. And I looked for her mother. There she was, walking alone, confident like anybody, you know, and a teacher. I'm telling you now, and I hope this doesn't sound wrong, it is a blessing. The gift that she has, it's a blessing. Not a curse, a blessing. Okay? Because she has blessed so many thousands and thousands of lives, not just in this country, but also in other countries. So here's my message to you today. When you look at people that other people call a problem or not normal, look again and you will see beauty. You will see God's creation. You will see an unbelievable talent. But you need to tell people that all the time. My students, when they come through my door, oh, whoa, whoa. the white students come in. I, I can tell you now what they say. It's so, they no longer do this anymore because I normally send them uh, to vet. So they, they come in <laughs> and um, the white students comes in. Oh, professor. Daar is nie meer vir ons blanke mense a plek in die son nie. Ons sukkel, dit is nou rechtstellende aksie en dit is nou net die swartes vir. And I sort of roll my eyes and I say, get the fuck out of here. I mean, come on, if you are going to start off with telling yourself what you can't do, then it becomes, as the lady said, a self-fulfilling prophecy. Then in comes the black student. He doesn't even know what he's saying. But he learned this in his movement. <laughs> oh, Professor, the commanding heights of the economy are still in white hands. I said, unpack that for me, comrade. What does that even mean? <laughs> but you see, we've learned the language of defeat. We've learned the language of defeat. That is the problem. And so look again. And I'm proud to tell you that my university is one that has spent more than any of the other 22 public universities, and I boast about this, f forgive me, on people with disabilities, whatever the disability is. Do you know when those three blind students were turned away the other day at Nelson Mandela Metropolitan University? I got their numbers from ETV. I called them the same day. I said, yeah, you can come and study for free. Just tell us where to pick you up. Just tell us where to pick you up. It's hard enough that you must simply try and find your way through the broken roads of Matata. That's hard enough. That is hard enough. Why must you double curse the person? When they made it to the campus, you tell them, go away, you're blind. It's hard enough standing in that long queue just to get that disability pay for a higher institution to tell you to go away. It's hard. That's why people with disabilities get so angry. They just, there's a beautiful word in English called chutful. They just become chutful. <laughs> because you've struggled for too long. And if I had to listen, I can honestly tell you, just I'm going to shut up. Eh? Uh, <laughs> if I had to listen to every bloody person when I was growing up on the Cape Flats, telling me what I can't do. And I had an uncle who was from Mannenberg. Now, Mannenberg, let me just tell you, is you don't want to go there <laughs> with all your limbs. <laughs> and Uncle Alfie was his name. Thank God he's now dead. But Uncle Alfie used to come to me. <laughs> and Uncle Alfie, he would literally take me and sort of, because I wasn't good in primary school. I really wasn't. You know, and Uncle Alfie would put, sorry Gareth, about uh, you paid a lot for this hairdo. Um, <laughs> and Uncle Alfie would put his hand on me and say, Oh, Johnny, they used to call me Johnny. Johnny, we love you very much. When somebody starts like that, you know they're going to piss you off. Johnny, we love you very much, but you know you're not the brightest pea in the pot. <laughs> he used to have all these things before he became literal. 
You know the belt doesn't go through all the hoops. <laughs> you know, Johnny, you're a few chips short of a Happy Meal. You know, he'd go, <laughs> he'd go through all. <laughs> they paid you to laugh, I swear. <laughs> Oh, you know, the, and, the, and when he went to Afrikaans, I knew now it's coming, and then he goes to Afrikaans and sort of say, oh, Johnny, you know, have you heard this expression, Afrikaans, die luchte is on, maar das niemand bij die ASD, you know, uh, and so. Then I knew Uncle Alfie, I said, why don't you, my boy, just go and sell fish with Uncle Jopi Solomon, Uncle Jopi was the fish seller in the neighborhood, just go sell fish with Uncle Jopi there on the corner of Prince George Drive, and, you know, and, uh, and so on, and we'll still be proud of you. If I had listened to Uncle Alfie, and he meant well. But when he looked at my results, my math marks used to be negative integers, minus something. <laughs> it used to be minus something all the time. Because those days they had negative marking, you know? Not like now where they give you marks for showing up if you're black. You must just show up. <laughs> you must just show up. You get 5% for showing up. No, no, no. Listen, listen to the message. Why do they give you 5% for showing up? Okay? The officials will tell you it's because, you know, the black kids are writing in their second language. Don't treat me like an idiot. The reason you're giving five marks is because you don't believe they can. That's why you're doing it. You underestimate our children. That's the reason. You taught them badly. That's the reason you're giving extra marks. That's the reason. We need to start telling ourselves as a country. We need to say that all our people head injuries, back injuries, whatever, Down syndrome, you need, one of the nicest stories, I don't know if she shared it with you today, that Cherie, uh, the moment she sort of became aware of what is going on, she started to think of herself as special as having an extra chromosome. And she would tell people, do you want my extra chromosome? You know, <laughs> as opposed to seeing herself in deficit terms. Stop telling yourself what you can't do. Keep telling yourself what you can do, and you will be. Finally, I just want to share this story with you. I was the other day in a road. They say this is the richest road in the world. It's called Page Mill Road. Have you ever heard of Page Mill Road? If you ever get to Northern California, go to Page Mill Road. It's right alongside Stanford University. And on that road, you will see the headquarters of Facebook. Next door, you'd see the headquarters of Google. Next door, you'd see, in other words, all the way down every, the headquarters of Hewlett Packard. Right down that road, you'd find all these major companies. So I went there, and I sat down with 12 guys who are billionaires. Not millionaires, billionaires. Not rand people, dollar people. <laughs> and I said, I want you to explain something to me. Now, you know, I always feel uncomfortable amongst rich people, you know, because I didn't grow up rich. And so when I see wealth, I get nervous. <laughs> Unlike Cyril, I get nervous, <laughs> you know. And by the way, if you don't vote for me, the Boers are coming back. Okay? Um, <laughs> so um, I feel very uncomfortable. So I'm sitting with these guys, but now I've learned how to, you know, sort of, because I have to do it in my job, you know, be comfortable with these people. So I say to them, but we were talking, and I said, there's something wrong here. Because none of them sounded like Americans. You know, because there's a particular American uh, uh, accent, and particularly in Northern California, you can pick it up very easily. So I said, excuse me, where are you from? South Africa. I said, oh, okay. What, where did you study? Rhodes. Oh, all right. Where did you study, sir? Wits. Where did you study? And as I went around the table, I can give you their names. Every one of these... <coughs> Wealthy men studied in South Africa. So I said to them, wait a minute, wait a minute. How did this happen? They said in South Africa we'd never have gotten anywhere. Because in South Africa they keep telling you what you can't do. I'm paraphrasing. They said, yeah, they expect you to be smart. They expect you to do well. And I can tell you that's true because it happened to me. They expect you to do well. So the guy develops an app for a cell phone. Overnight, he becomes a billionaire. And as we talked, I started to remember a guy called Elon Musk. He's there. He went to Pretoria Boys. Okay? 
And up to him, the Pretoria boys' main contribution to our culture was two hookers. <laughs> oh, sorry, rugby hookers. Sorry, I, I misunderstood. <laughs> John Smith and Terry, uh, Chili Boy Ralapele. I mean, that was their contribution. Here's a guy who's asked to replace the space shuttle fleet with a new fleet. That same week, two Nobel laureates in medicine. Do you know where the one is from? South Africa. They don't come from here. They go there. It's the same people. Here's my point. What is it in that context that is so different? They got their own problems, by the way. But what is different in that context from here? There, they expect you to do well. They're positive about their people. I want to say to the people here, to Sheri, to... Mavis, sorry, oh, sorry. I always say Mavis to whoever, you know. I was sitting one stair chair away from you when I heard you want to go with your boss with something special. I said, hey, so you better sit far away. But I want to say to you, hats off to you. Admiration. Obsolete admiracy. Baya baya donkey. You make me proud. I would come back here a million times. And thank you, Gareth, for your unbelievable heart. You see, when people hear Gareth, they sort of say, here's a smart-ass white kid, you know, from Turkey's... Um, doesn't get worse than that, you know, and, and, and so on. But let me tell you something. If I had to vote for president, I'd vote for him. Okay? Um, and thank you, Rina, for being <laughs> his guardian angel, for being an unbelievable support, not just to him, but to me. Uh, and thank you all for making this unbelievable day possible. Bye, Danke. Thank you, Prof. Ladies and gentlemen, to close, I'd just like to ask Sello from the Nelson Mandela Foundation to say a couple of remarks. I was hoping that we could open this up for questions. Unfortunately, we ran out of time, and I know that we all have important things to do here. We're all in important fields. We're all doing uh, things at, 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 in November, let me tell you, there isn't time for messing around. Sello, would you close off with just a couple of remarks? And then I'd just like to say, if you do want to remain, chat afterwards, I'm sure Tara won't mind if we spend an extra half an hour with people just getting to talk to each other. Perhaps you have some questions for some of our panelists. Please go ahead. But uh, for the moment, we must close off the formalities. Selo. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, you know, Prof, I have bad news for you. Uh, I'm, I'm a product of both vets and techies. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not sure what it, what it says about me, but uh, whatever it says... Uh, I think you, you believe something positive about me. Mm. That I, 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 there's something good, right? Yes, but Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but, uh, but, but I think uh, what, what, what I, I'd, I'd like us to, to walk away with from, from what uh, uh, Prof was saying and, and, uh, uh, the, the, uh, and Doctor, by the way, I didn't mind uh, be, you being my psychiatrist any time. <laughs> That's why I... I was going to go there, but I chose not to. I, <laughs> I'd like the points for not having gone there, Selo. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I could see when, you say, when she was saying something about being dis you kept on saying, no, I wouldn't dis discriminate against you. Yeah. Um, but but the, the, the point is, uh, for, for all of us, we, we need to, to, to look at, uh, le at, at all of you and, and say, you give us hope. Uh, because our country, one of the things that we, we tend to, to forget is that our country is built on hope. Um, that even those who, who have nothing, this year for Mandela Day, we focused on three areas. Uh, we addressed the issue of shelter, um, because there's no dignity in children living under plastic bags. Um, we, we, we looked at the issue of literacy. Um, my mother was, uh, I, I come from a family of a mother who was illiterate. She, in fact, told me at the, when, when I, I, I passed uh, my matric, went to her and I said, you know, I'd like to go to university. And she shook her head. My, my grandmother was lying there. She shook her head and said, with what? <laughs> so, and I knew what that meant, you know. So, so that, was the, that could have been the end. But what my grandmother said was, So if, uh, if, if, you, if a child is crying for a red hot uh, coal, you must give it to them, and they must hold it, and then they will learn that it's hot, and they, they will let go. So for me, it was, uh, she, she gave me that opportunity. But, but the fact that we, we, look, we, we looked at literacy tells you that we're saying you must always look at the issue of affirming dignity. 
because having to read my mother's letters when I was a child, and it was intimate details of, of, of things that I shouldn't know, told me that there was no dignity again. Um, so the third thing that we looked at was uh, the issue of food security. Uh, because uh, as Madiba says, for as long as there are people who go to bed at night without food, we cannot beat ourselves on the chest and say, we have arrived. Um, so there's no freedom for those people. There can never be freedom for as long as that happens. So I think uh, uh, the message that we'd like to pass on to all of you is uh, this shouldn't be the beginning and the end. If anything, we're saying, Gareth, as uh, the advocate of the Nelson Mandela Foundation, uh, we, we hope you continue to encourage these kind of dialogues. And we hope that you will continue to be dialogues uh, for a more uh, a, a tolerant country that accepts difference, not as a, that treats difference not as a threat, but as a point of empowerment. May you continue to celebrate difference um, rather than fearing difference. Thank you very much for coming through today. Thank you, Sela. Um, in closing, this was meant to be a, a discussion around a number of things. Um, and really what I like about this, and Prof, every time we get together, we start off going, anything could happen. But what I think has happened here is, is far more important than just a discussion around mental health or around treating everybody with an appropriate amount of dignity. What's really happened here is what Prof Janssen said earlier, we must put away this language of defeat. Today is a victory. Today is a victory for everybody who is involved in seeing a, a, a positive future in building a, a country full of people who can rather than people who can't and a country without excuses where there's personal accountability personal responsibility, and every single brilliant mind in this room, whatever you may regard as your impairment, yeah. is no longer an excuse. You have the ability to do absolutely everything, as demonstrated by these two, as uh, explained by the experts, and uh, the inspirations equally. And uh, remember, it's not about intelligence. Be very, very clever, and you can still have all kinds of problems and you can be very uh, unintelligent in the clinical sense and you can still have lots to be thankful for. Thank you very, very much for being part of this. Uh, do we have time for some questions? Just two or three quick questions. Who wants to ask something? I'm sure that there are people who've been sitting here with something on their mind the whole time and you can just tell me who you want to address it to. Is there a question from anybody? You don't have to feel shy or embarrassed. I assure you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. But, but you know, I just want to pick up on something that you said, which was really important. Then, even today with the new books and stuff, the notion of intelligence isn't schoolwork. The notion of intelligence is much broader. You know, I did a workshop very briefly uh, for young white uh, Afrikaans kids in Pretoria, uh, in um, Free State the other day, and Sheree was there. And they really struggled with race relations. And these are all kids with degrees or, and so on and so forth. The only person who understood what it meant to really reach out across these things was Sheree. So don't talk to me about intelligence as 
30% or 80% or 90%. Intelligence is also emotional intelligence. Intelligence is also the insight into our humanity. And so I like that notion, Gareth, of intelligence being elastic rather than one thing. Yeah. Can, I, can I just ask Dr. McLana, please? I mentioned earlier that everything in mental health is all lumped into one big disorganized box and people treat everybody in that box the same way. This is obviously not the way that we've got to, I mean, surely if you have a doctor who deals with, as you pointed out, just the heart muscle, and you have a different doctor who deals with feet, for example, they have very different areas of specialization. When it comes to psychiatry, you're expected to be a man of all seasons, almost. Do you think that this is an area that perhaps there is room for growth in, and that the public can learn to accept as being a far broader uh, rather than specialized, because in, individually that needs to be broken up too, surely. So everyone's taken the opportunity to stand. I hope you can see me as I speak. I actually don't quite support what you say. I think it's important for us in our fields um, to have discrete categories of mental illness and we're quite capable to treat the broad spectrum. But I do think that there is some gray area about intellectual disabilities and mental health. They aren't quite the same thing, but their disability and in terms of our legislation with the employment equity and the requirements that their um, conditions, you know, uh, minimum specific conditions to employ people with disabilities, I think that it should be more specific because those with physical disabilities are more likely to be employed, those with mental health disability or intellectual disabilities are less likely to employ it. But going back to what you say though, I get your point. For the general public, labeling in studies has been shown to make things worse. So you're a coolie, a nigger, a kaffir, these are labels. You're a psycho, you're a bipolar, these are labels. They're not helpful. They're helpful for us because we can then decide what investigations to do and how to treat, but for others, it may be more stigmatizing. So there's been a review about whether we need to change the term schizophrenia, and in Japan, they're rather using the term psychosis, because ultimately, even among psychiatrists, we're still just discussing whether this is one disorder, several disorder, we're still trying to find the genes, but what's happened is that nobody wants to live next to someone with um, schizophrenia. Nobody, especially in terms of the, you know, I, I spoke to about the social distance, because one of the things that happens with stigma is the prejudice and discrimination. So nobody's going to employ someone with schizophrenia. No one's going to leave their children with someone with schizophrenia. So um, I think in that way, labeling becomes problematic and it's useful for us in the discipline, but actually ultimately with psychiatry, everybody's the expert in mental health. They, we often confronted as psychiatrists with our patients and lay public telling us what's best for the patient. Oh no, all they need is just, you know, to grow up. This is what they'd prescribe snap out of it, um, amongst many other things. So these are our challenges, but I do think labeling becomes the problem. Um. Just now, is there another question? Ah, oh, did you have a question? I just want to go to the back quickly, ma'am. Do you want me to come there because... Uh, okay. I've got two granddaughters uh, that are twins with autism. And I've tried, I've tried everything. They are engaged with another uh, organization in Caltonville in the West Rand called Rotara. But it's like we are not reaching them. They are growing up fast and... I've, I've tried. The private uh, schools that we get, they are very expensive. We can't afford. So I'm asking if there is anybody that I can talk to who can assist me and my grandchildren. Thank you very much. Um, could we... What is your name, ma'am? Antebi. Tembi. Tembi. All right, Tembi. Um, Tembi, I just wanted to say... Um, well, thank you to everyone here. It was fantastic. Just to introduce myself, um, I'm Rachel Tambo, and I'm actually the patron of the South African Federation for Mental Health, of which Bharti Patel um, runs it. Um, just in terms of autism, uh, Dali and I, our fourth child, is on the autistic spectrum. So I can put you in touch with the people. What I can tell you, it's a long road. <laughs> okay, so... Yeah, and everyone will tell you when we, it happened to us that don't worry, it's like getting on a plane and what you wanted to do was go to France, but you've ended up in Italy. And I was like, no, I actually wanted to go to France in the first place. So, 
Okay, so all the best. Okay. I was going to offer that um, one of our team speaks to her too after this. So um, perhaps you can come to me and I can introduce you to our team and then we can see how else we can also lend some support. Okay. Charles, thank you. Thank you so much. See, there are people already here who are willing to help you. Thanks for coming, Mum Tembi. Um, all right, ladies and gentlemen, I, I'm afraid time constraints are, are, are starting to become a problem for us. So I'm going to have to close off today. If there's anything else, feel free to hang around. I think 15 or so minutes we've still got. But I think it, it's probably more useful if there are specifics that you either speak to members of our panel or if you need to go, you get going. Thank you very, very much for coming. On behalf of the Nelson Mandela Foundation, on behalf of Hands Across South Africa and all our terrific panelists here, thank you. Prof. Sherry for making the triple web from Bloemfontein. Dr. Mutlana, thank you for your expertise and for your advice. And thank you for attending. Of course, Nicolene and Headway, um, my friends, I'll see you at the Christmas party. It's not long to go. Uh, that's where I met them for the first time. My life has been changed for the better by my involvement with them. Uh, I met you, Nicolene. How could it not have been? Um, there, are, there are so many people who can make a difference in your life. You think your life is normal. You think everything is as good as it could be. You think you're okay. And then you meet people who you also imagine will, will, will open you up to a world of sometimes discomfort, sometimes a, a little bit of pain, sometimes a bit of sorrow. And the remarkable thing, as I'm sure all of you can attest to, in various ways, shapes, and forms. The remarkable thing that happens is that exactly the opposite takes place. You find yourself connecting, and you find yourself moved, and you find yourself inspired to get even more involved with other people. Thank you very, very much. I hope that's the message you take home today, and thank you for your attendance. Thank you to all our panelists. You are all very welcome. We'll continue this conversation. Thank you.